can't wait to do it. I'm not gonna do it. I can't wait to do it. Fragumini. And I'm Jeremy Whalen. Welcome to the season finale of The Transcript. This week, The Transcript looks into the challenges facing undocumented students as they head to college, talks to the Northampton crew teams, explores Afro-Latinx identities, and examines the realities of women in STEM. On Wednesday, NFL team owners unanimously approved new rules that include fines for teams whose players do not stand on the field for the national anthem. In recent years, many players, following the lead of Colin Kaepernick, chose to kneel during the anthem in protest of racial injustice in the United States. The rules allow players to stay in the locker room during the national anthem, but require those on the sidelines to stand for the anthem. Players have criticized the decision, saying it is a violation of their right to free speech. On Tuesday, the House of Representatives voted 258 to 159 to roll back Dodd-Frank rules that were put in place after the 2008 financial crisis. Under Dodd-Frank, banks that had at least $50 billion in assets had to abide by stricter financial rules. The bill passed by the House, which has already been approved by the Senate, allows banks with up to $250 billion in assets to avoid federal supervision and stricter rules. While Republican lawmakers have claimed that this will make it easier for small banks to lend money to people, some Democrats worry that it will open up the financial system to abuse similarly seen in 2008. On Thursday morning, the White House released a letter to North Korean leader Kim Jong-un from President Trump that scraps plans for the upcoming diplomatic summit. In the letter, President Trump claimed his decision to cancel the summit was due to tremendous anger and open hostility shown in statements from Kim Jong-un. The summit was set to take place on June 12th in Singapore and would have been the first face-to-face -face meeting between a U.S. and North Korean leader. Hi, I'm Flor Castillo and this is Tell It Like It Is. In the United States, undocumented youth make up about 16% of the undocumented population as a whole, and most of them aspire to attend higher education. This week, I investigated the challenges and opportunities that come up when undocumented students face the college process. While the federal law guarantees undocumented students the right to a free public school education, they face costly difficulties when pursuing higher education. In many states, they are required to pay out-of-state tuition at public colleges and universities, even in California, where many undocumented students are eligible for in-state tuition, they do not qualify for state or federal financial aid, including grants, work study, and government loans. I sat down with guidance counselor Anna Rigali to find out ways that undocumented students can attend and afford higher education. The application process is going to ask things about are you a Massachusetts resident, about parents and address and social security numbers. And all of those questions um, can be difficult for undocumented students to answer. Students who are truly undocumented, who don't have a visa, are not going to be eligible for federal financial aid, state financial aid. Um, they will be eligible for college financial aid, but that's usually not enough. It often means that a student's gonna have to take longer to do college, um, work at the same time that they're doing college, you know, obstacles that other students don't necessarily have to face. A number of 
scholarships can be available to undocumented students and scholarships really are going to be the best source of money. There needs to be more funds available to undocumented students, more foundations that um, have funds that students can apply to get. Having a specific resource at every college for undocumented students would be really great. I sit down with an undocumented student to make sense of the difficulties she faces and what she thinks needs to be done to help students in similar situations. I am not attending to any college right now. I was attending to a Holyoke Community College, but I stopped going to because of economic issues. I didn't have a social security number, so I wasn't accepted to any other college unless it was a community college. I wasn't able to get any financial aid because I didn't have a green card and most of the scholarships were only given to citizens of the United States. Maybe if the government uh, gives more financial help to the undocumented students and more colleges will give an, op an, an opportunity for more students. Even though undocumented students face many hardships into pursuing higher education, I motivate you to reach out for ways to help students in these situations. I'm Flor Castillo and thanks for watching my last Tell It Like It Is. Hi, I'm Lulu. Welcome to Hamped Up. Y'all ready for this? With summer coming up, many of you may be making plans to enjoy a nice boat ride on the river. But for members of the crew team, spending time on a boat is an everyday occurrence. Both the girls and boys crew teams here at NHS spend hours on the Connecticut River and spend lots of time on the weekends in surrounding cities and states. I sat down with senior Megan Mission and junior Adrian Alberto Fisher to learn about crew and what their typical practices and races are like. The coaches this year have been like really great. Um, They've been more invested than the coaches have been in the past, and they really um, show how strong we are. Rowing is different from a lot of other sports in that it's not just one season. So we, our big competitive seasons are fall and spring, fall being longer races on time trial and spring being shorter sprint races. There's like a huge integration between like ages. So we have like a middle school program, a high school program, and like a master program for like um, people who are above 18 and who want to continue rowing. Normal practice, we get here at 3.30. Um, we bring down oars, we bring down launch stuff, which is life jackets, first aid kits, anything the coaches need in their boats. I also sat down with boys team member Ethan Grant to learn about his experience on the crew team. We've had a lot of coaches over the past three years, four years. None of them have been that great. The current coaches are, I would say, the best coaches that I've ever had. They're definitely better than our last coach. They've worked hard to get us to be faster, which is great because we're definitely faster than we've ever been before. Race weekends, you get up early is the first thing. You get up at four o'clock on good days. Most of the regattas are pretty far away. You know, we go to places like Saratoga, Worcester, Boston, Providence. It's an all-day event. And it's usually pretty cold and wet. It's a pretty small team at the moment. And <laughs> we have three guys on the varsity team. So yeah, it's a tough sport, but it's very rewarding. And if you think you have it in you, then do it. Join the team. If you are interested in joining the crew team, you can visit NorthamptonRowing.org. In other sports news, baseball is home today at 4 p.m. against Chicopee. Girls lacrosse is away at 4 in South Hadley, and softball is also away at 4.30 in Aguam. Lastly, Boys and Girls Ultimate have states all weekend at the Oxbow. This has been my last segment. Thank you for allowing me to share sports news with you over the past semester. One last time, thanks for watching Hamped Up. I'm Lulu Kesson. I'm Ota Venice, and welcome back to Hit It or Miss It. Throughout the year on Hit It or Miss It, I've explored issues relating to both the Latinx and black communities. As someone who identifies as Afro-Latina and explores these social and cultural issues, I find it very important to look how these identities relate and form Afro-Latinidad. To get a better understanding of what Afro-Latinidad means, I sat down and talked with the Associate Dean of Mount Holyoke, Dorothy Mosby. To Afro-Latinidad, you know, people identifying um, as people of African descent, but also not wanting to let go of their, you know, Latinx heritage and history and culture, and really wanting to identify as both. 
not either or, but as both. Afro-Latinos are people who were conquered, you know, by the Spanish and, and, you know, were, as part of the enslaved process, were enslaved um, and racialized in particular ways, but also people who have held on to elements of African heritage. Afro-Latinos have always been around, but may not have been visible. And I think if you have more people who are publicly identifying, you know, themselves as, you know, Afro-Latino, Afro-Latina, Afro-Latinx, you know, that's a place, you know, that of importance. I think visibility and representation matters, and it matters an awful lot. When you're part of a larger dominant discourse, you get lost and your history gets lost. Not everyone has that same cultural heritage mm -hmm. and that you know people come from different places and different branches. Growing up as Afro-Dominican in America, my identity always felt like it was shifting so I was never viewed as Latina and or black. I sat down with my mom, Isolara Ulloa, to learn what it was like growing up in the Dominican Republic as a dark-skinned female. Aunque hay muchos como yo de mi color, pero son como están mezclados con diferentes como italianos, españoles, como que mi país es un país de, de diferentes razas. Si tú eres más oscuro que otra persona, siempre te, te lo dicen como y te llaman nombres también, como Prieta, Morena. Claro, porque ahora no se siente más más seguro, como más es mejor, como es mejor que antes, porque ahora ya in in toda parte tú estás viendo gente morena y eh, ciudad importante eh, cargos importantes entiende antes casi todos los papeles grandes o todos los más grandes eran gente o blanco o rubia mm -hmm. so mira ahora la la de rollo family la muchacha mm -hmm. ella es half morena mm -hmm. y half white mm -hmm. so se cada tan como más it was a pleasure working on the transcript and I thank NHS for allowing me to talk and being able to create new conversations within the halls of NHS. I'm Odette Bennis and this was Hit It or Miss It. Hi, my name is Salafina Foreman. And I'm Willa Sippel. Science, technology, engineering and mathematics classes, also known as STEM classes, are places for innovation and discovery. However, these areas of study have been notoriously male-dominated. According to the National Girls Collaborative, women comprise half of the U.S. college-educated workforce, but only 29% of the science and engineering workforce. But what is it like for women in STEM at Northampton High? We sat down with a couple of the many dedicated female STEM students at NHS to learn more about their experiences of being a girl in STEM classes. I mean, the main thing you notice is kind of how it manifests in like the different kind of gender um, roles I guess um, in that like when women tend to tend to raise their hands or ha like have an answer they tend to preface it by being like well I'm not totally sure but like I think this is the right answer. My good friend was, was a guy and, and we were very comparable in terms of a lot of different intellectual pursuits. Everyone sort of told him like oh my gosh you're so good at math and the, the thing that was told to me is like oh you're such a good reader, you're such a good talker. To gain a teacher's perspective on this complex classroom issue, we talked to Ms. Podell and Ms. Tohini. To improve girls' um, I don't know, in involvement and enjoyment of STEM fields, they need to have role models who are female. And I think that having science teachers who are females is one great way to start that. The idea of science and technology is to increase the quality of life. And in order to do that, you need to understand the way life is built, and you need to understand what different people need. In order to understand that, you need people from all sorts of different backgrounds. The number of, of women represented in STEM classes, um, you know, uh, students need to be encouraged to follow their passions. You know, younger students need to be encouraged to pursue something that they enjoy. Um, whether or not that's their traditional role. The differing experiences of women and men in school can extend past just STEM classes. Last year, senior Jesse Zeldas did an AP statistics project investigating the class participation 
of girls versus boys. People from minority groups are speaking less in class uh, than we would expect them to. So when I removed AP and honors level classes uh, from my survey, so the average woman was making 0.617 less contributions per half hour class period than the average man was. Uh, but when I looked at honors and AP level classes, that difference was much, much greater. A lack of women where the contributions are being made is having sort of a compounding effect. Like not only are they making fewer comments because there are less women, but they're making even fewer comments per student because of the lack of other women in the environment. Having a diverse population in STEM of all sexes and gender identities will allow the improvement of the classroom experience and the betterment of the field of study for all. I'm Serafina. And I'm Willa. Thanks for watching. And I'll see you next year. Thanks for watching. The Transcript team has worked hard this year to bring you 30 episodes of The Transcript every Friday morning when school is in session. We are so grateful to our amazing transcript crew, our advisor Jeremy Whalen, and the teachers and students of Northampton High for keeping our broadcast alive. We encourage everyone to join the transcript crew next year and you can pick up applications in room G16. And make sure to head over to nhstechnology.org to watch the final episodes of In Other News and Humans of Northampton. We'll get uh, seniors that come in that are on a fixed budget. We have uh, families where both parents are working but they just can't make ends meet. Uh, nothing much.